Hello, and um, thank you for joining us today. I know it's a very busy start to January already, so thanks for um, giving up part of your lunch hour uh, for this lunch and learn. Um, so we're here today um, uh, to rerun the um, one of the original um, uh, presentations that we did to the Young Professionals Conference. Um, and um, so Caring to Waste are a technical recruitment company uh, specialising in highways and transportation markets, of course, uh, amongst others. Um, and we're here to talk to you today about how to future-proof your career. Um, and we wish uh, to thank the CIHT for allowing us to speak to its members today. It's a, it's a real honour to be here again, um, and hopefully you'll receive lots of value. Um, as I said, this was originally intended for the Young Professionals Conference. Uh, the feedback was very, very good. Um, but there's lots and lots of content um, and, and nuggets of knowledge for uh, the decision makers and the, and the more senior um, people in the, uh, um, uh, obviously members as well. Um, so we're going to aim for around about 15 to 20 minute presentation and then about 15 to 10 minutes on the Q&A at the end. So if you think of, of, of any questions that pop into your mind uh, as we're going through the presentation, feel free to pop them in the, in, in the, in the Q&A box up there um, and we'll review them at the end. Um, if we're short on questions, we have got lots that we uh, couldn't answer for, for time factors from the original presentation. Um, so quick personal introduction. Um, personal introduction. Um, my name is Simon Gardner. Um, I'm actually uh, a co-founder of Carrington West um, and, and a director of, of um, uh, amongst other areas, the, the team that uh, uh, places um, people into permanent roles within the high resident um, and the infrastructure sector. I'm Adam Butler. I'm the team leader of the highways and transportation team um, and have specialised in highways and transportation recruitment for um, the entirety of my uh, nine years uh, doing recruitment. So, Karen's Waste, a quick intro about the company. Um, some of you may well have heard of us. Um, we actually started life um, in, in a garage, in fact, my, my brother's garage. I always like to mention that one. Um, in, in January 2011. Um, and from that time, We've grown from two to 76 people, um, and we've done this primarily by a, a combination of two factors. Firstly, allowing our consultants to become true experts um, in, their, in their very niche sectors. So we talk here about inch wide, mile deep, um, and, and we also look after our staff very, very well. We've won national awards for that. And those two combined means that, you, that it, you know, the, the advice into the market, the client and the candidate market, um, it's from someone that stayed many, many years with our company and dealt only in a very niche sector. So um, our, our consultants become true stakeholders in the industry in which they just happen to recruit. The result of this is obviously fairly strong financial sales. Um, and from a location perspective, we're based in Portsmouth as a head office, um, but we have offices in London, Birmingham and Manchester as well. Um, and from a client perspective, um, we, uh, we, we're truly national with clients also in Scotland, Wales and Ireland. Um, aside from highways and transportation, we have six specialist teams um, covering rail, town planning, utilities, buildings and water. Um, but in fact, it was our highways and transportation team that was our inaugural team, the team that we set the company up uh, with. Um, and it's still our flagship department now. Um, hence, we're here today. We, we do consider ourselves um, experts in our field. Um, we work with clients on, a, on both a permanent um, and an interim basis um, with household names such as Kia, Capita, um, Amy, Atkins, Mom, McDonald, amongst others, um, as well as hundreds of SMEs across our business. Um, we also got a fairly large presence in the contractor market, um, and we also uh, placed into 200 local authorities last year as well. So what are the key takeaways from today's session? So hopefully, um, you'll, uh, you'll leave today's session um, with a better idea of the skills that you need to develop to kickstart and progress your career. Um, and, and as I said, from a, from a decision maker and more senior point of view, there's also some, some, some good content in here as well. Um, it, it really is simple advice, um, but it comes from the hundreds of conversations we have every week um, with hiring managers who lay out to us what they're looking for, uh, obviously we're going through the recruitment process. Um, so when it comes to learning and development and future-proofing your career, Carrington West have recently won, just before Christmas, uh, the Investors in People National Award um, for the UK's best learning and development program here internally. Um, and we actually, that was the second year in a row that we've won that. So we are very well placed to, to, to comment and, you know, if needed, share our expertise. Even after this session, 
with, with more uh, senior people on how we've done that. Um, so um, this is our second year of partner, partnering with the CRHT um, and, and for various projects, obviously, including the Young Professionals Conference. And we've done something similar with the RTPI um, and hopefully our partnership will continue to add great value here as it has done in the planning sector. Um, so as part of our partnership this year, we did a series of research surveys to understand how the working environment has changed um, over the past few years. And um, we had a fantastic response and um, 1500 actually respondents across the three surveys. So if anyone in today's audience did respond to either or all of those, um, thank you very much. It has allowed us to glean a huge amount of, of important data and the trends from that data, um, which we're going to discuss the, the, the edited highlights with you very shortly. Um, we've only got half an hour, so if you wanted to read the full report, it's available to download on the CRHT website. Or, um, you know, at, at, uh, we'll share our direct contact details at the end, and we'll, we're happy to obviously um, send that report to you. Um, so we're actually going to discuss today some of the findings from the third survey which relate to the skills uh, in demand. Um, so this is a breakdown of the people uh, that we spoke to, uh, and this is the, bro the breakdown of the respondents. Um, so as you can see, we had a very nice even spread across the country from a variety of different organisations. Uh, and so really the point of this um, is to share with you that no matter the size um, or, or um, location of the organisation that you either work for or wish to work for, the responses were very, very similar, um, which was excellent and provides us some valuable information in terms of how to future-proof your career, identifying similarities, but more importantly, the gaps in opinion between employer and employee. Right, so I'm gonna to talk to you about some of these details. Um, so we asked uh, managers and young professionals um, uh, in survey three about skills that um, different uh, levels were lacking and about training. If you identified that you were a manager, um, you were asked questions about what young professionals and junior employees uh, were lacking. If you identified as a young professional when answering the questionnaire or someone who didn't manage people, you were asked about skills and training that you wanted uh, from your employer. So one of the first things that we came across was that um, there was a huge difference in the expectation levels of certain skills. This primarily focused on IT. The largest difference we found was actually with a non-engineering software and uh, with Excel, 95% of employers expected employees to have a basic or above level knowledge of Excel at entry level. So this is as soon as they, they join a the business with, with no experience. Whereas 75% of employees, this is young professionals, those that don't have management responsibility, expected their employer to provide them full training on their software. This is obviously a huge difference between expectation and reality um, and could be the first sort of area that we can recommend to young professionals and to anyone looking to progress their career that uh, undertaking further training as simply as, as watching videos on YouTube on how to use Excel or, or even a more tailored course is something that can really future-proof your career. This wasn't limited to just um, Microsoft type softwares. Obviously, we asked about industry specific softwares. So, again, some huge differences. We, we asked about AutoCAD, which is, as you're all aware, a basic engineering software. 85% of employers expected basic or above knowledge of AutoCAD at entry level staff, whereas 72% of junior young professionals expected full training from their employer on AutoCAD. Again, this is a huge difference of people that are hiring. Um, what they expect from junior um, members of staff and, and an actual reality. Again, uh, a, a difference again, 65% of employers expected basic or above knowledge of BIM, BIM softwares um, and 73% of junior professionals expected to be fully trained. Uh, we also asked about some other specific softwares, so uh, things like micro drainage, civil 3D, site 3D, uh, for transportation, LINSIG, Junction 9, Saturn, etc. These came out a lot more even that, that both employers uh, expected to give training and in, in employees and young professionals expected to be trained in these softwares. But it was these specific um, ones that, that employers expected their young professionals to have. And again, it was another learning opportunity for junior staff that they could upskill themselves and get themselves ahead in their career. So then we asked what 
caused the, the IT skills shortage. And again, there was a big difference. Uh, employers felt that the young professionals were not being taught in their undergraduate degrees um, how to use these particular softwares. Whereas um, undergraduates, junior um, entry level staff, young professionals felt that it was their employers not providing them with adequate training on this software. So again, there's a huge difference, uh, an expectation of skills coming in and an expectation of training from, from junior um, staff there. We also asked for some comments on what um, other skills that young professionals might lack that they could train on to, to help them future-proof the career. And these were the top 10 most common responses that we had. Um, a few that I wanna highlight. The first one is report writing and particularly technical report writing skills. Over 10% of all comments we got mentioned a lack of experience with technical report writing from young professionals. Whereas Young professionals, the, those that answered that didn't have management responsibility, um, almost didn't mention it at all. So this is almost like a blind spot for, for junior uh, and, and like I say, young professionals. They don't know that they're not skilled in this area. This is something that um, is expected from, from employers. It was understood and accepted by those that responded that um, junior members of staff knew how to complete an academic report but actually a technical engineering report, they, they had very few skills. And one other interesting area was that soft skills like problem solving and critical thinking were flagged. Again, if someone looking to future-proof their career and, and improve their chances of getting hired, um, training in this area, extracurricular work, uh, books, but reading books on problem solving and critical thinking is a really great way to, to um, push your uh, career forward and also future-proof it, but also for managers, to so there as you can train your junior staff. So how, how is the training delivered? Um, so this slide produced a couple of good bits of news and, and, and what, one sort of word of warning potentially. So first good bit of news is that employers are fully on board uh, with training and accept that they need to provide clear training paths for young professionals, which, which, which is fairly obvious, which is good. Um, an overwhelming 97% state that they provide time during the working day for learning and development to be carried out. Now, that's something that we would insist on here at Carriage West as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, obviously the further good news and, and, and fairly obviously um, is that, um, you know, no one's gonna frown upon um, or, or discourage extracurricular or out of office learning, but for it to be available during the working day is, is, is excellent news and a great start. Um, the results here, um, clearly show that the training and development is something that's still very much expected in the workplace post-pandemic. But the question really is how best to deliver that um, in, in, in the future. Um, and it's something that's, um, that's obviously going to be uh, need to be reviewed as we, as we move forward. Um, so I suppose most dangerously on this slide, if you consider that um, the vast majority, 65% um, of training, is the informal at the desk, either peer-to-peer -peer or peer-to-manager uh, mistake correction, um, ad hoc conversation type training. Um, now, how is that going to be protected um, and what measures are going to be put in place to protect that as we as we move uh, into a post pandemic working patterns? Um, so before we end, we wanted to just mention that we are we're obviously still in a period of change when it comes to working patterns. Um, it's almost certain that um, you know, most of us will either be you know, at least in some sort of hybrid model going forward. Um, and many organisations may not have fully adapted yet in terms of how they are going to deliver training. But that didn't stop 65% of employees claiming that the training programmes have already been adapted uh, to accommodate remote workers. Now, interestingly enough, only 43% of employees uh, actually agree, uh, obviously actually agreed with that. So um, young professionals appear to be the ones that have had their learning and development opportunities impacted the most. Um, and a majority of respondents, 66%, um, mentioned that L&D for young professionals is now harder than the pre-pandemic, um, and 41% of professionals um, uh, state that they don't feel that they get the same support as, as they previously did. So I suppose the lack of training and development opportunities uh, for young professionals was, was always going to be uh, the likely consequence of, of, um, of remote working forced upon us at such short notice. Um, 
especially in those more informal opportunities, as I mentioned in the previous slide. I suppose the headline for decision makers and the headline for the more senior uh, decision makers here um, is that um, you know one fifth, twenty percent of respondents said that the pandemic had affected their career progression. So that's definitely something that needs to be addressed. Um, so uh, you know, as we mentioned at the top of the presentation, if you have any questions or anything sprung to mind, now's the time to start populating that Q and A box. Um, but just before we come on to questions, uh, we just wanted to recap. So. As Adam stated earlier, um, please help yourself by standing out and, uh, and upskilling in the more generic non-engineering software packages. Um, now this could mean you know, trampolining through the organisation that you're currently in, um, or indeed if you were going to look uh, for opportunities in the future externally. Um, we know it's a key area and there are lots of online tutorials, free or low cost. Um, and once you've approved, once you've far beyond you know, what we consider average, and maybe approaching sort of you know semi-expert level, expressly state this on your CV uh, and, and please discuss it without being prompted in a candidate selection process. Um, it, it's amazing how important uh, things are to, to, to employers that you know accidentally get admitted because they're just assumed that, that, that people possess these skills in, in, in an interview process. So please expressly state it without being asked. Um, and obviously when applying for these roles, you know, avoid asking the usual four, three or four generic questions at the end. Um, you know, really focus on on on, um, on learning and development. Um, it, it's there is a duty of care from your employer to you um, for you to be trained and upskilled properly. Um, and arguably, as a young professional, um, it, it's equally as important um, as, as your compensation package, maybe for your first role or two, um, and certainly in terms of your future career progression and employability. If you're missing a business critical skill, um, ask for training um, and please inquire about the time during working hours for learning and development to be carried out as 97% of employers said that this would be the case. Um, and finally, you know, we're always here to, you know, we feel free to reach out to us at any point. We can, we can go over some of this content. We can send you obviously the full, obviously the full report um, and we can talk at, at, at you know, obviously at any point confidentially to either employer or employee um, about uh, about the current market. So um, we will go on to questions um, and uh, not hugely technical, but let's try. We're going to the Q&A box. Um, so do we unshare, do we stop sharing? I think we do. Right, it's Q&A. So incidental office learning, e.g. Um, overhearing a discussion or seeing a screen and commenting um, and mentoring support is more difficult with hybrid working. How can that be improved while people are remote working? Well, um, that, is the, that is the huge question, isn't it? Um, I don't think, to be honest, um, it's, a, it's a simple answer. Um, what we've done here um, and, and this, this may or may not answer the question, but we um, completely coincidentally, um, to, to, to be honest, launched our online hub, um, our, our online training platform internally for recruiters. Um, and we launched it in early March 2020. Now that was obviously, you know, we didn't know it had a crystal ball. It actually took almost a year to roll out. It was fairly expensive uh, and a fairly big investment for us, but it just so happened to land Two weeks before we were all sent home um, and had to work remotely. Now that was the start um, here of, a, of an internal dialogue, um, and we uploaded hundreds of hours of, of videos, um, some that some that were, that were provided to us, we bought the rights to, um, and some that that um, we recorded ourselves. And that was the start of a community, um, and it's carried on here. So you know we, we do insist that people you know do it here we don't want to we don't want people to promise to do it at the weekend and not do it we'd rather than do it here but that was the start of something that's now developed now how you take that and and, and offer ad hoc questions um really is um really is a tough one to answer and i think as an industry we probably need to get together um and and, and come up with some ideas um you know yes there's teams yes there's zoom yes there's q a boxes like this Overhearing conversations remotely is going to be a. It's going to be. It, it, we're going to need to look to, to 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 technology to provide that. I'm sure. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'd agree. You, you can't substitute being able to listen to somebody um, really with technology. You can't substitute someone just being able to lean over and look at the screen for a quick question. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of experienced senior and, and principal engineers that are pleased that they can sit in quiet and not have a lot of questions. But as we've seen, is the way people learn. And so at the moment, there isn't a, um, there isn't a workaround. There isn't a workaround for sitting next to somebody and being able to ask them a simple question, um, being able to show someone something very quickly on a drawing or, or on a report. Um, it, it, if you're working remotely 100%, you have to book in this time and it has to be a, a, a very conscious thought, a planned in moment rather than a, than a quick ad hoc um, uh, question and answer session. Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing I would add to that is, I mean, obviously there is a work from home order in the UK at, at the moment. If you can work from home, you must work from home. Um, but when this is lifted um, and there is the opportunity to be in the office, um, you know, certainly I would I, I would take it as a young professional or, or someone that's someone that's starting out. Um, you know, take that as much as you can. Um, travel's not, you know, it, it, it's easier to stay and work from home. But in the long run, I think the most, you know, the more office presence you can get in the early phase of your career, um, if, if your if your company can allow that to you, unless you're on a rotor system, hot desking, you know, if you can maximise your office time. Um, in, until you're proficient in, 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 in each level of your career, or I'd, I'd suggest um, to, to certainly consider it. Um, right, we've got a second question here. Um, what kind of evidence would be appropriate for showing our proficiency uh, in Excel, for example? Um, I mean, yeah, that's very. That's a very good question. Obviously, level of proficiency is different for each employer, but I think what what we what we mentioned in the presentation was that, that um, most employers expected a basic or above basic knowledge. So they weren't expecting you to be experts. They weren't expecting you to do masses of pivot tables and, and macros and all, and all this sort of work. They expected you to be able to run simple formulas, to be able to create tables and be able to read a, um, a spreadsheet um, and be able to pull information out of it. Whereas the junior um, uh, like I say, the young professionals that were that were asking were almost expecting full training um, on the software as if it was uh, you know completely new to to them. So um, yeah, it, it, they're not exactly asking you to be experts um, in it, but they they want you it, they don't want it to be completely new, like a, a foreign software to you. It has to be something that you've used. You can do simple equations, um, you know, be able to pull out bits of information. And, and use it without constant um, assistance, essentially. Yep, um, good answer, good answer. Um, right, so we've actually got some questions. Um, again, feel free to pop them in. We have got around about six minutes left. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. We have got some from the original sessions, actually, that um, were pretty round and, and we, we couldn't get to them all. Um, so, so there was one from Harriet Parkin. Um, do you think that people have more hands-on experience from apprenticeships or university? Um, well, I, yeah, that was a, it's a good question. I guess if you're looking at just hands-on experience, then, then you would say that um, ultimately apprentice, apprentices, you, you do have hands-on experience because you are in the office or on site, um, you do get that hands-on experience. There is obviously a huge difference in your understanding of your field if you if you're an apprentice or if you've been to university and studied a degree. So it's about whether your employer expects you to have the educational background of a degree or not, and whether that will help you with your career or not. Um, it's it's about um, what's expected in your next employer rather than um, which one will give you better experience. I think or you know, versus hands on. Yep. Um, Another question. Yeah. Uh, so, what is the best way to convert the skills covered in modules as an undergraduate into the workplace environment? So, yeah, again, very good question. Obviously, you want to make sure that you're utilising your degree. I think the, the, the advice we always give to, to junior um, members of, of um, 
the you know, young professionals and junior members of staff that come to us is about working in the field that you want to. A lot of degrees are very um, spread out. You cover a bit of everything. You could do structural engineering one day, geotechnical, highways, so on and so forth. So, forth. so once you've got into that specific um, area, you become a highway engineer for argument's sake. Um, going back through those modules and refreshing yourself with those, um, what you learn there. Putting it into practice is about asking your senior um, senior members of staff, about asking your team leaders, your senior engineers, your principal engineers, about what they think would be most useful for the modules that you study. You explain to them what you've studied and ask them what you're going to need to know during your um, day-to-day working um, in working life, what you're going to be doing day-to-day, -day, ask them what they think is important and then refresh from there. It's, it's much better to get it from your employer, from your team leader and ask them specifically to sort of guess and work back and think, oh, how can I convert all this work from my, um, from, from, from my degree into a, uh, you know, into the daily life. Find out what was important to you now and, and then go backwards and get it from there. Okay, uh, just looking through the previously asked questions, um, you mentioned employers expected staff to be trained in software packages at undergraduate level. Are employers in contact with universities and colleges specifying they teach these skills? Um, so from our experience, the answer is no. Uh, we, obviously, there are lots of companies work with universities on sometimes on specific projects or um, have an affiliation maybe with the university, but there are very few that define uh, academic criteria or, or syllabus within degrees or whether that be undergraduate, postgraduate, whatever it may be. Uh, usually a module is taught by a professor who is a specialist in that field and therefore they de design the criteria and, and the curricula um, related to the subject they want to teach. So th there is a I think a gap, the big gap, and again, it's just highlighted in the survey, there is a gap between learning, um, theoretically learning engineering and learning um, certain modules and then putting it into practice. And universities are, at the moment aren't in a position to really be able to bridge that gap. They are teaching you how to understand something, whereas your employer will show you how to do something and how to, to actually make it um, Put it into real world, uh, in real world environment. So we've got a, literally a couple of minutes left. So if there's any last minute questions, feel free to pop them in the box. Um, if not, there was uh, there was one in the original session from Barry Gannon. Barry asked, "What advice would you give to employers to assist with the on-the-job training for young professionals in the remote working environment?" So similar to similar to the first question, I, you know, I, I mean, as I said. In those sessions, if, if anyone um, or, or, or you know any member wants to reach out to me, um, I'll, I'll flash our. Um, in fact, let's let's share our um, contact details again very quickly. If you wanted to reach out to us, um, this this is our email address. This is our phone number, and, and I can share with you exact softwares and the exact process that we use to set up um, our remote training program um, and, and what we call our learning hub here. Um, all, all staff get a login um, and it's, it's you know similar to sort of online training that you might see with their providers like Kajabi etc and you can and you can click when videos have seen you can see the notes that they've done um, and, and you can add constantly um, pathways onto there and create pathways between the learning material um, and it's it's gone down very very well um, and, and as I said um, I'm happy to name actual specific softwares and things if you reach out and we, we can we can share that no problem. Um, so um, just checking the Q and A box. I think we've answered everything. Um, so if if you get back to your desk or, or driving home this evening, um, or if you're working remotely, um, turning off your computer, um, feel free. Uh, and you think of a question that, that you wish you'd asked. Feel free to to, to reach out um, and and um, possibly our direct contact details will be will be shared again. Um, and we can we can answer any questions um, for you. Feel free to reach out. And we can answer anything over the phone as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.